Art, thank you everybody for being here. Um, this is an atypical event because we have two speakers, so it's a double talk, but I thought that they work in um, dialogues in a very interesting way, so hopefully that will work out. I have to thank uh, a number of people because this event was actually made possible thanks to the Office of the Provost and of the President, uh, French and Italian and German. So thank you everybody for the contribution. Um, um, probably Dominic Lacapra doesn't need an introduction, but hey, let me do this. <laughs> Um, Dominic Lacapro graduated at Harvard and then in 1969 uh, started teaching history at Cornell University where he also became professor of humanities and comparative literature. He's also a senior fellow at the SCT, uh, Cornell School of Criticism and Theory, where he was uh, associate director from 96 to 2000 and then from 2000 to 2008 he was the director of the school. That's where we met. Um, he's also a member of the uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, you know that uh, to summarize his work, I mean, it's impossible. So I'll just say a few, few words. Uh, he's most famous for his groundbreaking work on trauma and the Holocaust, and also for bringing, uh, again, the tools of critical theory to the study of history, and also the work he did on uh, violence and victimization uh, progressively led him to rethink, to question, to probe the relationship between humans and animals, or better yet, uh, between human animals and other than human animals. Um, and uh, every time I read him, I am so impressed by the effort for clarity, the intellectual honesty, the brilliance. Um, so it's a really um, a great uh, work that we have where also students can read this work and really there is this effort to communicate and to um, make available nuanced and even very complex discourses to the curious reader, really. Um, he's also author of a long list of influential books. I will only mention three. Hey, Barry. Uh, History and Transit, Experience, Identity, and Critical Theory. History and its Limits, Human, Animal, Violence. History, Literature, and Critical Theory. And then his latest works that's called Understanding Others, uh, People's, Animals, Past, has just come out literally this week with Cornell University Press. And uh, with, um, in this latest work with the uh, current political situation in mind, La Capra continues to question anthropocentrism and hence poses one central question. To what extent do we and can we understand others? People, species, times, and even places. And uh, I don't think that we need to defer any further the gratification to hear him speak. So, here. Uh, uh, thanks, Amanda, and thank you uh, all for coming. And I should say, probably my most read book is something called Writing History, Writing Trauma, a lot of which is, is very, very accessible. And this, I think, too, will be accessible. Uh, Humanities have placed emphasis on such crucial uh, issues as race, class, sexuality, gender, and globalization. And I stress that these issues are and remain important and are well worth investigating. Uh, recently, the scope of concern uh, in a number of quarters has turned uh, to expanding the horizon to include other than human beings. Uh, and in the most thought-provoking efforts, the result is not simply adding species to an agenda of topics uh, to teach or write about. It's rather a, a kind of rethinking of the humanities in their relation to the uh, post-humanities as well as the what we're in, what Johann is now terming the pre-humanities uh, and post-humanism. And I'll uh, use the term uh, post-humanism and post-humanities in a very broad sense that encompasses other things. Uh, in different ways, uh, the approaches involve a concern with other than human beings and the way humans have treated and should treat them. 
Uh, other than human beings comprise two major categories, other animals and other life or lifelike forms, large and small, such as cyborgs, robots, bacteria, uh, machines, especially in the expanding uh, field of artificial intelligence. Both categories are significant and there's no need for a zero-sum game between them. They need not detract attention from one another. Because of time constraints and my own interest in research, I'll focus on the uh, issue of other animals and what's been termed critical animal stu studies. That's sort of the label now uh, for these kinds of endeavors. Uh, I, I nonetheless point out something you can also find in this recent book, Understanding Others, uh, something we might discuss, let us say the relations between post-humanism and what many are now calling post-secularism. Uh, post-secularism has a complex relation to religion and extends to such beings as ghosts, spirits, angels, and so on, whether in literal, even hallucinatory, or figurative terms. Uh, one recent and I think very thought-provoking uh, understanding of the ghost and haunting sees them at least in part as post-traumatic effects or symptoms. And this is rather recent, I think, to see the ghost as a post-traumatic symptom. An interesting speculation by the very difficult psychoanalyst Nicholas Abraham is that the ghost of Hamlet's father, who haunts his melancholic son, uh, is uh, the uh, transgressor who has committed a heinous act whose effects are not known to Hamlet but have been passed on in a kind of post-traumatic way to Hamlet. It's very interesting mm -hmm. speculation. In this book, The Shell and the Colonel, he actually rewrites Hamlet and has a sixth act which goes into the story of the father in Fortinbras and how he poisoned his sword and uh, dueling. Uh, this is a form of uh, transgenerational transmission of trauma, which we can talk about. A very interesting topic, uh, still contested by many people. In the transgenerational uh, transmission of trauma, descendants are haunted by parents or other forebears' traumatic experiences of often secret crimes or transgressions, things that are kept secret from the child but nonetheless have an impact on the child. And this is the case with the Holocaust for many children of Holocaust survivors. The parents never talk about it, but the effect is more uh, powerful to the extent that it's something there that you know about and that you met your imaginings, if at all possible, go beyond even uh, the stretches of the empirical fact, which go very far. Uh, uh, Abraham uh, even uh, writes in his 1975 uh, Notes on the Phantom, which is included in this book, The Shell and the Colonel, that, quote, what horns are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And these gaps are, in a sense, post-traumatic effects or symptoms. Uh, this notion of the transgenerational tr transmission of trauma uh, has been applied uh, to children and intimates of victims as well as perpetrators in, in such uh, incredible events as the Holocaust, slavery, child abuse, and other uh, uh, extreme uh, activities where children and other relations are haunted by what their parents and other forebears underwent or did, in the case of child abuse at times to them. And one interesting book, rather powerful book on child abuse, you may know this book, uh, Soul Murder, by a man named Leonard Shengold, written a number of years ago, uh, which has a, a number of very interesting case studies and also arguments. Yet symptoms, symptoms such as haunting images, recurrent nightmares, and repetition compulsions may also be experienced as more or other than symptoms when the bonds with them are more or less ambivalently, ambivalently valued and even taken to be as dear as life itself. Beloved in Toni Morrison's novel of that name is a ghostly being emerging from the traumatic aftermath of the Holocaust. Uh, but she's also an uncanny object of both anxious apprehension and love. In her 2017, The Origin of Others, a very recent book by Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. Toni Morrison even writes, quote, Beloved the girl, the haunter, 
is the ultimate other, clamoring, forever clamoring for a kiss, showing in a sense, in a way, her own effective involvement in the character of beloved. Uh, it may be plausible to argue that the humanities have been and typically remain anthropocentric. Uh, they traditionally, uh, if at times inadvertently, uh, situated the other as a scapegoated outsider. What the French psychoanalyst uh, Lacan, Jacques Lacan, would term, in a very interesting neologism, an extimate other. Extimate is a neologism uh, combining external and intimate. Uh, an extimate other is a source of anxiety that is inside but also projected outside the self to assure one's secure integrity. And this integrity might include one's very identity as a distinctly or even uniquely human being. Uh, in certain ways, the other than human animal is at times subjected to terror and traumatization. And it has arguably been the scapegoated or extimate other of humanism and the humanities. And I'll give you a few examples. For example, v Wittgenstein famously in the philosophical uh, investigation said, if the lion could speak, we could not understand him kind of uh, something taken up by someone like Thomas Nagel in a very similar essay about can we understand what it is like to be a bat? And the answer is no. We cannot understand what it is like to be a bat because we're so different. Uh, Wittgenstein also famously stated in the investigations, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Uh, and Heidegger, with an analogous understanding of the seemingly decisive importance of a rather restricted idea of language, which is basically human language, uh, argued that the animal is without or poor in world. So in a way, the limits of its language are the limits of its world. And it has a very poor world because it has a very poor language, and if any language at all. Uh, in Kant and others, it seemed to go without saying that only the human being has dignity. And we could go into how Kant uh, gets there. And it's noteworthy that the German word for decent or upright is anständig, A-N-S-T-A-N-D-I-G, anständig, meaning literally and figuratively upright or upstanding. And upstanding has a very similar meaning in English. It means you're standing upright and you are an upstanding, decent human being. You don't go on all fours. Nothing going on all fours can be anständig. Uh, Primo Levi is for me, as for many others, uh, an exemplary writer and witness concerning the Holocaust. Uh, yet, as an avowed humanist, he typically invoked anthropocentric stereotypes to refer to the abuse and humiliation of Jews, saying that Jews were treated like animals. Uh, and one should attend to the way this very common commonplace uh, expression to treat or to be treated as an animal seems to assume that the victimization uh, or the abuse of animals is to be expected. It, it goes without saying. It doesn't call for commentary, uh, which is really rather amazing. Uh, I think uh, that one may at times find it uh, in, in that in complex thinkers such as uh, those I've just mentioned, you find other tendencies in their thinking which call into question such categorical statements and such prejudices in general. But the recurrence of such unselfconscious attitudes and usages remains very, very common. Uh, as I indicated in some quarters, this is starting to be subjected to sustained critical attention. Derrida's, uh, you know, l'animal que donc je suis is, is something uh, that does that, but there are many, many other uh, works now going in that direction. Uh, so I, I think one could conclude that it may now be, or at least should be, commonplace to contend that there's been something like a recurrently displaced but compulsively repeated quest, a quest for a kind of holy grail. The holy grail would contain criteria that decisively separate the human from other animals. Uh, in a way, it at times uh, involves a disavowal or denial of the animal in the human. The criteria have taken many forms, not only language, but soul, spirit, reason, uh, freedom, 
and of course creation in the image and likeness of God. That is to say, in some sense, the human being is transcendent with respect to the animal body, that may be there as a kind of purveyor of the human, but the spirit, you know, as in Socrates as well, the spirit is held captive in the body and seeks to escape it somehow. Uh, the quest for the decisive cr criteria often downplays what brings us closer to other animals. Not only sometimes contested animal languages, about which I think we're learning more, but also mortality and the capacity to be aggressive, yet also to suffer, empathize, mourn, be traumatized, be victimized, be resilient, be affectionate, be trusting, or be joyful. All of these things, and there are many others which bring us very close to other animals. Uh, there may at times be good reasons to investigate similarities and differences between humans and animals. For example, the differential effects of food, medicines, drugs, and so forth. And there are differential effects. Chocolate, for example, is not very good for your dog, but it's very good for you in certain ways, in moderation. Uh, but I think that when you begin inquiry with suspicion or skepticism concerning any quest for the presumably essential dichotomizing differences or set of differences between humans and other animals. Uh, this quest still continues, even in forms often taken as unquestionably scientific. The one example is uh, a recent book by a man named Thomas Sudendorf, S-U-D-D-E-N-D-O-R-F, Sudendorf, uh, Sudendorf. His very well received 2013 book, The Gap, the science of what separates us from other animals. The science of what, and his idea of science is I think very contestable. Like many others, Sudendorf relies for purposes of comparison on an ideal type of the human being, rarely if ever encountered in reality. Someone, generally a healthy, able-bodied adult, someone imaginative and open-minded enough to generate endless scenarios and narratives to be shared with other open minds. Uh, apparently without the interference of ingrained habits, prejudicial stereotypes, mocking laughter, quasi-instinctive talking points, and limited horizons, not to mention repetition compulsions. And it's very easy, interesting to see what is taken as the human being, and it's always an idealization. Uh, and you always go from the human to the animal. What can we do and how much can they do it or not do it? Never the other direction. Never what can the animal do and how much can we do it? Which is done in indigenous societies, very rarely to the advantage of the human being. Uh, and uh, as an aging swimmer, one statistic, a depressing statistic I like, is that the fastest human being can swim about five whereas the average fish swims 35 miles an hour. <laughs> so you've got a lot to catch up with there, I mean. Uh, moreover, much evolutionary thinking seems to displace the earlier hierarchical great chain of being in which the human being is at or near the apex, uh, just below gods and angels for those who believe in them and sometimes taking their place for those who don't. Uh, what I think has become increasingly obvious is that the differentiating criteria of the human can never be established with the decisiveness and more arrestingly with the invidious and exploitative consequences with which such criteria have been overtly or covertly put forward. In his wittily entitled uh, book, which I like very much, as Amanda knows, uh, in his wittily entitled book, Are We Smart Enough uh, to Know to know, uh, I'm sorry, are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? A book published uh, recently in 2016, Franz Duval, F-R-A-N-S, de W-A-A-L. Franz Duval, who was the, the uh, director of the uh, Primate Center at Emory University for a very long time. Franz Duval, like Darwin, argues for differences of degree, not kind between humans and other animals. He observes that, quote, uniqueness claims or exceptionality claims typically cycle through four stages. They are repeated over and over. 
they're challenged by new findings. They hobble towards retirement, and then they're dumped into an ignominious grave. Uh, and I would underscore the first stage and note that endless repetition, endless repetition is crucial to the success of dubious claims, including the role of the big lie technique with which we unfortunately have recently become familiar again. The technique is to tell a big lie that others would not have the nerve to tell. After lying bigly, stand your ground, deny all counter evidence, intimidate your accusers, and endlessly repeat the lie, often projecting what you were accused of onto your accusers, such as abuse or victimization. So recently, not you, the woman credibly, credibly accusing a man of assault, but me, the man, I am the victim. That has become the recent meme in a lot of venues. Uh, for a variety of self-interested, prejudicial reasons, this simple-minded pivot and project technique involving the big lie is very often successful. It was successful during the election campaign. Uh, it was theorized, actually, not in the realization that they were virtually uh, quoting Mein Kampf, but it was theorized by Robert Ner Mercer, uh, one of the big supporters of Trump and many others. The technique of endless repetition of the big lie. And Hitler in Mein Kampf is very interesting. He says everybody's just telling a little lie. Forget about the little lie. Tell a big lie and repeat it endlessly. Uh, an important point for post-humanistic research is that the attention to animals and processes affect affecting them uh, would be a valid question to raise in evaluating work, I think, in the humanities. For example, a study of war and the impact of bombing, or uh, the works of uh, various figures in literature and history. Uh, an example of a novel I uh, discussed briefly in this recent book and more extensively in another book is uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness has been written about and written about and written about. One thing I've never seen written about is the question of ivory and where does it come from? Itomy ivory is an object of desire in the novel. It is Kurtz's quest, uh, uh, but uh, it just appears uh, as an object. Uh, the effect of ivory poaching on elephants and elephant societies, which is devastating, uh, is not even alluded to. Uh, and this is not something that competes with colonial or post-colonial studies, it complements them. Uh, allow me also to mention something else uh, in uh, my book, uh, which I mentioned towards the end of the third chapter. A woman named Hilda Keen, very interesting historian. Hilda Keen in her 2017 book, and this is a play on another title, The Great Cat and Dog Massacre, uh, recounts the largely suppressed or repressed story of the panic killing of pets or companion animals by people of London during the first four days of World War II. During the first four days of World War II, over 400,000 animals were killed, companion animals. And this is from six to 10 times more